that I remember about Daniel Boone as a boy? Well, it won't be hard getting me started, but you may have trouble getting me to stop talking about him. Of all us boys growing up in the Allegheny frontier, Daniel was the one you'd notice first. He was lean and strong even as a youngster, and unusually sure-handed with tools and guns. None of us got much schooling in those days. Remember, I'm talking about way back in the 1740s. But there was still a lot to learn. The littlest children were taught to shoot a gun, and if you miss too often, you got a licking. I don't reckon Daniel ever got licked for missing a shot. He had a real passion for hunting, a passion that was to last him all his life. But shooting wasn't all we had to learn in those days. People lived in log houses then, and before you built your house, you had to clear a place for it in the forest. And Daniel was as handy with an ax as he was with a rifle. We were on the edge of the Indian country, and we never forgot it. We didn't have Indian attacks too often, but once in a while, a stray war party from over the mountain would stage a raid. Even the smallest child was taught to be cautious in the woods. Daniel was always the first to know if an unknown sound was a squirrel, trees rustling, or a hidden savage who might mean danger. Though friendly Indians occasionally visited the settlement, there was always a threat of hostile ones. And these hostile Indians had been known to creep near peaceful communities and kill or carry away children while the kids were out looking for stray cattle. Do you remember the cabin Daniel built all by himself when he was still just a lad? I sure do. He used to go out there in the woods and stay alone for weeks. Seemed lonely to some of us, but not Daniel. There was plenty of game, and he'd spend his days hunting deer, bear, squirrels, and grouse. And wild turkey, too. They were real good eating. Sam here knew Daniel after he and his family moved farther south to Yadkin, North Carolina. I sure did. Daniel was about 15 then. And besides being a fine hunter, he was a good farmer. I was to his wedding, too. Of course, that was some years later. But what a cabin raisin that was. <laughs> prettier bride or a happier one? Well, Rebecca Bryan sure got herself a fine man in Daniel Boone. I don't wonder that folks come from miles around for a wedding like this one. <laughs> and lady, just look at that feast. Why, there's beef, pork, fowls, venison, and all kinds. And wild turkey, bear meat, potatoes, cabbages, and cornbread. No one's gonna go home hungry from this wedding. Well, all that square dancing sure builds up an appetite. You gonna stay around, Sam, to help the young folks build their cabin back in the woods? Yeah, sure am. Everybody will lend a hand. Just like Daniel to want his place to be further back toward the mountain. Just seems like that young fella always wants lots of space around him. That's the way I remember Daniel, too. He was always a man to need plenty of elbow room. That's probably why some years later, he had John Finley as a guest for a couple of months in his cabin. Becky, I want you to stay around the fire some tonight with the men to listen to some of John's stories. Daniel, has he really been to all those places beyond the Cumberland Mountains? Yes, and he says it's rich country with wonderful soil and game everywhere. You know how scarce the game is getting around here now. The Yadkin Valley is getting too crowded with settlers for me, Becky. We need more room to breathe. And I suppose you and the other men wouldn't mind leaving the governor well behind you either. I don't know why England chooses to appoint such men to administer the colonies. The abuses of the governor and his men are getting too much to bear. But the danger, Daniel. Unknown country. Savage Indians. Would you really consider leaving this farm and taking me and the children to live in such a wilderness? Only after I'd seen it for myself, Becky. Five of us men are talking about forming a party to explore this new land and see how great the risks are and if it really has possibilities for a settlement. We can hunt and trap, and the pelts will pay us for our time and trouble. The boys are old enough now to do the chores while I'm gone. Yeah, come listen to John Finley, Becky. Then make up your mind. I'll listen to John Finley, Daniel. But I don't need that to make up my mind. You're a good man, Daniel Boone. I know you want only what's best for us, and I trust you. Thank you, Becky. All a man needs to be happy is a good gun, 
good horse and a good wife. Oh, Daniel. I remember when the party left. There was, besides Daniel and Finley, John Stewart, Joseph Holden, James Murray, and William Cool, all fine, courageous men. They started on the 1st of May, 1769, and they were afoot instead of on horseback because the routes were unknown to them. And they took very few provisions, for the wilderness would supply them with food and shelter. It would have been too slow and difficult to cross the mountains, so they followed the westward flowing streams. They were passing through wild and beautiful country that few white men had ever seen. The streams were plentiful, the soil black with richness. Wandering at last along the banks of the Kentucky, they realized they had come upon a settler's dream. They discovered strange mineral springs where the buffalo and deer came down to lick the salty ground. I remember Daniel talking later about the game said he'd never seen its like before. Buffalo, sometimes hundreds in a drove, and deer in herds, and there were bear, elks, and wild turkeys everywhere. They built themselves a little cabin on the Red River and had a fine time hunting, trapping, and exploring the country. Maybe Daniel wouldn't have had such a fine time if he'd have guessed it was going to be two long years before he was to see his home and family again. That may be true, but there was no way in knowing from the time they left, the 1st of May, till near the end of December, they didn't catch sight or sound of an Indian. Although the whole region was supposed to belong to the Cherokee and Shawnee. Then, one day when Daniel and John Stewart were hunting in a cane break near the Kentucky River, a dozen Shawnee warriors sprang up. Daniel, they're right on top of us. There isn't even time to fire our rifles. I know Indians, John. There's no escape in getting captured. But we mustn't show fear. Our best chance is to act friendly. Pretend we don't really mind being taken. You come with us, white men. Yes, we come with you, mighty warrior. I remember how smart Daniel always was at figuring out Indians. Funny thing, too. He fought them on and off all his life. But at the same time, he could always see their point of view. He didn't hate them, not at all. He treated them fair and square for the most part, at least whenever he could, and they seemed to respect him. Oh, he was an enemy of theirs all right, most of the time, but a couple of times a tribe even tried to adopt him and make him one of their own, and that's the biggest compliment an Indian can pay a white man. You're sure right about that, and this was just one time when he was one jump ahead of them because he could think like an Indian and imagine what they were going to do. At first, Daniel and John Stewart had guards every night at the Indian camp. During the long days, John Stewart followed Daniel's advice. He behaved as cheerful and as unafraid as Daniel himself. By the seventh day, the suspicions of the Shawnee were lulled enough for them to do away with the night guards. Then Daniel acted. John, John, are you asleep? No, Daniel. Do you think the right time's come to try to escape? The fire's almost out. It's dark enough, and everyone's sleeping soundly. We can thank that special feed of roast buffalo meat for that. I think... Wait. Be still. What is it? One of the braves. The one nearest the fire stirred. Ah, but I think he's asleep again now. We'll have to make our way out of here by inches. There's sleeping bodies everywhere. And you know as well as I do that just the breaking of a twig could give us away. If they discover us trying to escape, they won't deal with us as kindly as they have up till now. Are you ready? I'm with you, Daniel. And you know, they not only crept their way out of that camp, not making the slightest sound, but they even regained their rifles. You'd think that'd be enough trouble for any two men, even if they did make good their escape from the Shawnees. But that wasn't all. Not by a long shot. You're remembering, too, how it was when they got back to the little cabin. That was quite a blow. The cabin had been ransacked. All those valuable pelts, eight months hard work trapping, were gone. And worse, there was no sign of the other four men. That's right. And no one to this day knows what happened to them. 
Finley, Holden, Murray, and Cool just vanished without a trace. Maybe Indians got them, killed and carried them off when they stole the pelts. Or maybe they tried to get back to civilization, lost their way, and perished in the wilderness. That sure was a mystery. You sure got a hand it to Daniel and John Stewart. They couldn't afford to return to Yadkin Valley empty-handed because they had all gone into debt to make the journey. So instead of being discouraged, Boone and Stewart resolved grimly to start all over again. Pelts weren't good at that time of year, so they concentrated on getting deer skins until they could trap again. Their ammunition was getting low, and they were troubled by the fact that Indians were known to be in the countryside. But still they stuck it out. And that's how it was when Daniel's younger brother, Squire, came upon them with his companion, Neely. And what a feat of woodsmanship that was. Imagine two men alone in an uncharted wilderness finding the one pinpoint in an unmapped region of miles and miles where Boone and Stuart were. I know that Squire Boone returned home with pelts and deer skins to sell several times during the long months ahead, and that Daniel finally came home himself. But whatever happened to Stuart and Neely? Again, another mystery. Stuart went off one day on a hunting expedition. When he didn't return by nightfall, Boone became alarmed and went in search of him in the forest. It wasn't until five years later Boone found some bones in a hollow tree with a powder horn beside them. A powder horn with Stuart's name cut into it. Neely was so frightened by Stuart's unexplained disappearance that he decided to start for home. He was never heard from again. And if all this weren't bad enough, when Daniel and Squire Boone did head for home, they were ambushed by an Indian war party and robbed of everything. They returned to Yadkin Valley with only their shirts on their backs. That may be, but Daniel believed the journey had all been worthwhile. Becky, you wouldn't believe it. I know the past two years have been very hard on you, but you'll understand everything when you see this wonderful land of Kentucky. And you really feel we should settle there, Daniel? Yes, I do, Becky. And we won't be the only ones to go. Squire and his family are coming with us. There'll be five more families joining us further along the mountains. And I'm sure our number will increase. There are a lot of restless, land-hungry men right here in Yadkin Valley. It's going to be a good life in Kentucky, Becky. But the Boones and some of the other families were to pay a high price for this new life they sought in the promised land of Kentucky. I was part of that expedition, and I remember well what happened. Everything was planned as carefully as possible. Daniel, our guide and leader, was no man to undertake so large a project lightly. Months were spent in preparation. Still, in those days, this was three years before the start of the Revolutionary War, there were so many unknown factors no one could foresee. We had with us everything we'd need to start a permanent settlement. Household utensils, axes, bedding, pack horses, swine, cows, seeds for planting. Everything we'd need, but there was no room for luxuries. We camped one night on the trail to await the arrival of a group of 40 men who were to join us. They were leaving their families behind until the settlement was better established. Boone sent his eldest son, James, who was about 16, to get some flour and farming tools and to tell a part of the joining party where we were. The boy took two men and some pack horses with him. Oh, Daniel! Oh, Jamie, gone forever! Well never see him again. <laughs> How did it happen? Hush, dear. It's no good weeping. We must remember ours isn't the only family tonight who's lost a loved one. But they were on their way back. So near. Why did they camp for the night when they were only three miles away from us? How many were there? Two from this camp. And Jamie, of course and six men from the other side of the mountain. Ah, they must have lost their way and not known they were so near us. At daybreak, a Shawnee war party came upon them. Only two of the men were able to escape. If it's any consolation, dear, Jamie and the rest must have been killed on the spot. 
Perhaps without even quite knowing what was happening. Daniel, I've heard some of the women say their men are talking about turning back. They're frightened now. If they want to go, they're free to. And God be with them. I think most of the men will elect to stay with us, however. Most of us have already sold our farms. And there's nothing to go back to. It's always hard settling new country. But if we keep our courage, I believe our children and our children's children will thank us for it someday. And we'll always remember, won't we, dear? That Jamie played his part in this big adventure, too. I'm afraid, though, that Daniel was a bit too optimistic. Quite a few of the men did turn back. And those who went on with the Boone party seem to have lost spirit. You're right, I fear. Daniel moved his family for the winter into a friend's abandoned cabin on the Clinch River in Tennessee. It was cold and lonely. And they were hungry sometimes, too. And, of course, they mourned the loss of their Jamie. <laughs> Daniel's dream of a real settlement in Kentucky was still a long ways off. The Clinch River in Tennessee was as close as they could come for the time being. And that wasn't the worst of it. The news of the Indians' massacre of James and his party had spread. Settlers and would-be settlers were filled with anger and thoughts of revenge. On the other side of the mountain, the Indians were also talking of vengeance. White men were found killed in their cornfields without warning. That went both ways, don't forget. Many young braves were senselessly struck down, too. You're right. And things got worse when three stupid, vicious white traders murdered some Indians in cold blood. And the Indians who were killed had no reason to know they weren't safe. They were being entertained by the traders at the time. That's what changed Chief Logan, the powerful Mingo leader. The Indians who were killed were relatives of his. Up until then, Chief Logan had been a champion of peace. Now hate filled his heart. He dug up the war hatchet he had just buried, lifted it above his head, and took a solemn oath. I, Chief Logan, leader of the mighty Mingo, swear that nothing and no one can stop me until I have killed ten white people for every member of my family so treacherously murdered. The Mingos weren't the only red men anxious for war with the whites. The Cherokees and Shawnees were carrying war pipes from Indian village to Indian village, painting their faces and bodies, droning chants, doing their traditional dances, and preparing for a bitter fight. But the colonists were making their own preparations. Every boy and man capable of carrying a gun was called into the militia. Forts were built in frontier valleys. Scouts were sent out to locate Indian forces and report on their activities. 